And today, together with Alessandra Rodriguez Gomez from INPI, Brazilian Institute for Space Research, and Gabriela Takahashi Mayoshi from Sao Paulo State University, UNESP, and several other volunteers and members from the Geosciencing Remote Sensing Society Brazilian chapter spread all over the country. We are starting today with a great, great uh, pleasure, our annual event that in this year is in its sixth edition, the GRSS Young Professionals and ISPRS Student Consortium Summer School. For the first time, it is totally virtual and participants from all continents and more than 50 countries, as mentioned before. What is a great pleasure for us. Thank you all for your time. Whenever possible, please write in the chat your name and country. And before we start, I just want to show a short video is less than five minutes, okay? And it's a video from the ISPRS Student Consortium delivered by the current chair, Ms. Cheryl Rose Rice. Hi everyone, my name is Cheryl Rose Reyes and I currently serve as the president of the International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing Student Consortium. I am very happy to welcome you all to the sixth edition of the IEEE GRSS Young Professionals and ISPRS Student Consortium Summer School this year. To start this event, I would like to present a bit about the ISPRS Student Consortium. We are the official representation of the youth to ISPRS. We link students, young researchers, and professionals worldwide interested in photogrammetry, remote sensing, and spatial information science to promote their scientific and professional developments. We advocate imaging and geospatial science for informed, scientifically valid, and technologically sound observations of Earth conditions and trends that lead to improved and effective decision making. The consortium is also accepting registrations for individual membership. Please scan the QR code in this slide if you are interested to join us. I work together with members of the board of directors from all across the globe. Charles from Uganda is our vice president. Charmaine, who is currently in Ireland, is in charge of our newsletter. Mustafa, our social media administrator, is from Turkey. And finally, Sona from Azerbaijan is our web administrator. One of the major events that we host and coordinate every year are the summer schools. In 2019, the summer schools were in Uganda, Poland, South Korea, and Brazil. These summer schools provide international learning opportunities for students and young professionals at a minimum cost. This year, we scheduled three summer schools, but due to the COVID-19 situation, Two of them were postponed and we are sincerely thankful to the organizers of this summer school for making this an incredible virtual event. This is the first ISPRS Student Consortium Summer School that will be hosted online. And as you can see, we have an amazing lineup of speakers who will deliver lectures on remote sensing and machine learning. The consortium currently hosts the virtual rooms of the webinar series to provide our community with more opportunities to learn and interact with experts in our scientific community. The webinar series was conceptualized in 2018 and we have organized webinars on Google Earth Engine, computer vision, and machine learning. The virtual rooms is an initiative to keep the members of the consortium connected during this challenging time and to help them navigate our changing lifestyles. All the resources for the webinar series and the virtual rooms are available on our website and our YouTube channel. We also publish an official newsletter called Spectrum, which covers the broad applications of remote sensing, photogrammetry, and spatial information science and welcomes contributors from diverse backgrounds and disciplines. 
We publish four issues a year, and our most recent issue is related to the current pandemic and the significance of geospatial information in tackling the impacts of this global health crisis to our society. The ISPRS Congress is one of the biggest gatherings in our scientific community, which is held every four years. The Congress hosted a virtual event for all papers submitted this year and postponed the in-person meeting for 2021. During the Congress, the consortium will be hosting a three-day youth forum, which will feature the following activities. Speed dating, technical sessions, a special session on women in remote sensing, photogrammetry, and spatial information science, a panel discussion, the general assembly for our members, a student night, another summer school, and will co-organize a mapping party. The consortium would also like to invite you to nominate papers for the Excellence Award to be given during this event. Please scan the QR code for eligibility and nominations. Also, please visit the ISPRS Congress official website for updates. Finally, I would like to invite you all to join our communities on Facebook, Twitter, and to visit our website for all the information shared in this presentation. And again, I would like to invite you all to register as an individual member by scanning the QR code on the right. This is the end of my presentation, and I wish you all a meaningful summer school. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl, for the nice words and the wonderful introduction. We again acknowledge the tremendous support from both societies, Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, and International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing in supporting our annual events since 2015. Well, our event this year consists on several lectures and a very intense program. And we will start today with Professor Raoni Guerra Lucas Rajon from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Rajon, thank you a lot for accepting our invitation. Well, Professor Rajon is with the Department of Production Engineering at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, as mentioned before. He took a PhD in organization, work, and technology from Lancaster University in 2011. His research focus on the relation between science, technology, and policy, with a particular emphasis on deforestation control. And today, he will deliver the lectures entitled The Role of Geosciences in Achieving Deforestation-Free Supply Chains in Brazil. Professor Rajon, thank you again for accepting our invitation. So you are the first speakers from a total of 12. And we thank all the participants coming from all the continents and more than 50 countries. So, please. Do it. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Veraldo. Thank you very much. Also, thanks, uh, uh, Je Professor Jefferson, for, for the invitation and for the proposal. It's a really, real pleasure to be here. And, uh, and looking here on, on, on the comments, it's possible to see, you know, uh, uh, people coming and commenting from Greece, Turkey, Serbia, uh, lots of them from different parts of Brazil. So uh, I'm really glad to be here and participate in this. Uh, so, um, so what I'm going, we're going to be talking uh, uh, today is it's uh, on the role of geosciences in achieving deforestation-free supply chains uh, in Brazil, which also related to to an article uh, that I was one of the the co-authors uh, that we published, our team published uh, in uh, in Science uh, early this year that had had quite a bit of, of a repercussion and a policy impact. Uh, so my objective here is to, to, deal about, to talk about this topic from uh, a technical and a scientific point of view, but also 
uh, emphasizing the challenges involved in making science that matters, a science that has policy and impact, and a science which, uh, which basically tries to answer the demands uh, from, uh, uh, from society, not only in Brazil, but also in other countries. So I'm, I'm starting now with going on, on full screen. I hope you still see my, yeah. Um, so one of the first points uh, we want to raise is, okay, why to monitor supply chain? Why is it important to know uh, where our food comes from and, uh, and where is it produced and how it's produced? And, uh, and historically, the issue of monitoring supply chains has been a more of a matter of of uh, health and sanitary issues. And uh, for instance, one of the big pushes towards um, the monitor of supply chains have happened in Europe following the mad cow disease uh, in the UK. And, uh, but more and more, uh, the debate around monitoring supply chains has been uh, about uh, environmental issues, um, and not only in, in Brazil, but also in other countries, such as palm oil in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, 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 cacao, in, uh, in Africa and other products, timber, there has been you know, a lot of discussion about monitoring the, the, the timber supply chain in Europe and the United States with specific regulations. And more recently, there has been a lot of debates about uh, the issues of monitoring, especially soy and beef supply chains, uh, 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 especially those produced in Brazil, uh, who is the, the, one of the world's biggest producer of both uh, and big exporters of both uh, beef and, and soy internationally. And, uh, and, and at the same time, we know from other research that uh, large scale cattle ranching and agriculture expansion are some of the key drivers of tropical deforestation, uh, especially in Brazil. And, and at the same time, we have a problem where uh, when you deforest uh, uh, without the proper authorizations, which, which we found and also the studies have already been pointing out, are uh, mostly done without uh, those authorizations. So illegally, you are not only uh, doing a damage to the environment, but also you're committing a crime. And uh, and since due to due diligence uh, procedures adopted by different countries, uh, you cannot buy a product that is linked to a crime. The same way you cannot buy a, a blood blood diamond uh, from from Africa, for instance. Uh, so it's very important uh, to for companies increasingly also for different countries to know where the, the, the product's coming from and whether it's linked to deforestation, whether that deforestation is illegal or not, uh, since it, it, it raises uh, other issues, not only environmental issues, but also uh, legal issues. And, uh, and one of the challenges we have today is that if you look at what the companies themselves uh, would show on their behalf and basically what they would present to the public, what they would present to buyers uh, is, per, is more, more or less like this. I've you know, uh, just you know, obscured, uh, I've hidden here the name of the company that doesn't matter here so much. But what, one of the points I want to raise for you is that uh, this company here as many of the big uh, um, cattle uh, uh, meat packers in Brazil, a lot of houses in Brazil, uh, they have uh, actually, uh, they have signed an agreement with the public attorneys whereby they have to monitor their own supply chains and they have to declare and show uh, via uh, independent monitoring how how that's going on. And uh, and basically what they are seeing here in this report uh, from 2019, just you know, published last year, uh, is that they, they published zero heads of cattle uh, with Ill illegal deforestation. Um, so, we, so basically they are saying they are completely clean. And at the same time, for instance, in the, on the website, what they're saying is that, uh, that this company has highly, uh, a very, has scored very highly in a global sustainable uh, ranking. However, what we see next is uh, news, news articles and investigative journalists such as this uh, from The Guardian uh, saying that meat giants selling uh, to, to the UK are linked to deforestation in Brazil. And, uh, and, and we don't not only see this on, on, uh, on, on, on news articles, but actually we, we, you, we see this in, in different uh, uh, scientific articles that have been pointing out that a lot of the cattle production in Brazil uh, is linked to, to deforestation. Uh, so how come you, know, you have those two worlds, right? Where one is the company saying, uh, here, we are all clean. And then what we see next, uh, all the sources saying that's not quite uh, the case. So one of the big issues here is that uh, private monitoring alone uh, has not has been proven to be unreliable. Just because there are you know there's so much uh, there, there is on the one hand the promise they have zero deforestation and you have data sources from other sites saying that's not the case. And at the same time, uh, the Brazilian government, uh, which has the means to do 
uh, a transparent and, uh, and strong monitor of the supply chains fails to do so. Apparent doesn't want to do so, so far. And, and so uh, in this, you know, what is the role for us, which are, which are researchers, which are outside the government and outside the private sector, but which have uh, the, the technological and the, and the scientific means to contribute. So how can we contribute to that? How does John Science could contribute to change the situation and to improve this, the transparency of supply chains? And it's and it's not uh, 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 a easy uh, problem uh, because first of all you have the issue of okay how do you detect uh, deforestation okay how do you uh, of course since Brazil it's it's, it's of the size it's, it's of a continental size uh, to detect deforestation from the ground uh, would be very expensive and also uh, uh, very unreliable uh, so it's it's very important to. Uh, adopt, especially uh, satellite-based remote sensing for that purpose. And, uh, and then in that case of Brazil, we are uh, really privileged uh, because thanks to the efforts from uh, the Brazilian Institute for Space Research, INPE, uh, in the last 50 years, we have one of the most transparent and, and reliable uh, uh, deforestation monitoring systems uh, in the world, which has been ongoing since uh, 1988. And all the data is completely uh, available online in all the the images that IPE used to do the classifications are also free, which which means and in, in, in open and in, in available, which means that uh, it's possible to, to perform uh, independent verifications of those results. Uh, but that's that it doesn't stop here. It's not enough to see that there has been deforestation on the ground. You have to relate that uh, to a specific farm, uh, to to the legislation, and to a specific supply chain. Uh, so um, what we, you need next is to identify. Okay. Where that has happened, where, where, where that deforestation has happened, is it close to a river? So it's basically interfering with repairing forests, so the damage is bigger. Uh, what, what kind of biomes is taking place? And the major challenges in terms of cartography, hydrology, biology, in order to, to obtain that information, organize that information. Uh, you also, and this is very crucial here, uh, you need uh, uh, to distinguish what, what kind of deforestation uh, is legal and, and how much of that is illegal. And, and in order to understand what's legal and illegal, you need to understand the legislation. And, uh, and so uh, it's very important here to, uh, in a, as part of a multidisciplinary team, also involve people which have uh, knowledge in law uh, and also engage with, with broader discussions with, for instance, uh, the, the public attorneys, with the, the, mini the ministries themselves, uh, in order to have a proper understanding of what the legislation is saying. Um, and then after you have basically the input data, and now so you, you, you were able to uh, derive from a very complex legislation such as the Brazil's Forest Code, uh, which established conservation requirements, you must transform those requirements uh, and with those raw input data into uh, information about the level of legality of a, of a specific farms. And, and this is possible uh, thanks to spatial modeling, uh, which again is, is it's another discipline, it's another area, which has its its own uh, challenges, and then uh, if you have, if you might be able, for instance, to do the spatial modeling of one farm, uh, applying all those rules. And you are talking about here uh, the need to ana to analyze data with a, with a high level of, of resolution. But what we need here, in order to, for instance, understand uh, deforestation in Brazil and most importantly in the biomes of the Amazon and the Cerrado, which are which which comprise more than a half of the country, uh, you need to do this evaluation for a million farms and on, on in, a, in a territory which is the size of a continent. And in order to do that, it's not enough just to apply, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 basically to, uh, to apply a simplistic approaches, uh, which does not, need, does not deal with the issue of scale. And so what we need really here at this point is to involve also knowledge about computer science, parallel computing, uh, big data knowledge, uh, big data science. Uh, uh, basically, and and finally, you need also to be able to in interpret those results because they they are going to tell you that you have that that much deforestation, that you have that much uh, uh, legality and illegality in certain territories. But in order to make sense to that and basically come up with policy suggestion, uh, having a social science perspective of things, um, a, a, a management science perspective on things, uh, it's very important. So um, I'm I'm bringing here those different issues in those different layers of the of the problem solving, uh, just to give you also an idea of how interdisciplinary this kind of work has to be. And 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 uh, and thanks to a big team which is behind us, uh, we have been able to engage 
and, and to answer these kinds of problems. Uh, and so basically here's, you know, it's an overview of uh, most of our team members, uh, which are led by, uh, by Professor Betaldo Soares Filho, who is the coordinator of the, sense, the, the Center for Remote Sensing, uh, which, which actually one of the leading experts in uh, spatial modeling and has been developing the Dynamica EGO uh, software, which is an, a, a free software which, from, based on which we develop our, our uh, modeling. Um, also, Felipe uh, Nunes, uh, which one of the lead models in our group, and myself uh, as coordinator of the laboratory for the management of environmental services, in addition to uh, uh, GIS experts, um, uh, human geographers, uh, social scientists, uh, computer scientists, uh, in order to climatologists. So it's basically, we are talking here about uh, a, a wide array of expertise which are brought together uh, in our team. And, and there, there is also a, a long trajectory uh, that, we have to, that we have to basically go through in order to reach uh, where we are. And starting from the work led by the Professor Betaldo Suarez Filho on modeling uh, deforestation in the Amazon in the early 2000s, and uh, which basically was possible thanks to the development of uh, Dynamica uh, EGO, which is a software which nowadays is used in more than 30, 40 different countries, um, that led us to, to understand uh, the land use in Brazil from the present and the future. And since uh, we, need, we needed to project land use in the future, it was very important for us uh, to understand what are the limits of that expansion. And the limits are mostly not only physical limits in terms of uh, suitability of, of certain parts of the country for certain crops, uh, but also uh, the, 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 the legal possibility for clearing those areas and using those areas according to the legislation. That's why uh, in 2014, uh, we we, we uh, managed to, to finish a study uh, that was also published in Science uh, called Cracking Brazil's Forest Code, where we applied for the first time uh, the, the special modeling of, of the forest code for the, for the entire country in order to understand how much forest surplus different farms have, which means, uh, you know, basically forests that are beyond what is required by law and, and how much forest debt uh, those 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 farms have so basically they have deforested too much, and it was basically expanding on this approach uh, and now at property level and at a, and, and with a, a five meter resolution model that we developed our uh, latest research which was published in two thousand uh, earlier this year uh, a few months ago as rotten apples of Brazil agribusiness also uh, in in science. And this is the schematic of what we have uh, developed. Uh, so first, uh, there is a first part of the problem, which is which is break, which uh, which about trying to model uh, the Brazil forest code, uh, which means bringing together here uh, the data about uh, um, the CAR, which is a registry in Brazil, uh, which identifies uh, every single farm. Um, then also, it's very important to combine with those property boundaries also land use data, and this comes mostly from uh, INPE. Uh, which provides the annual deforestation, but also uh, we use Mapi Biomas, which is an initiative from research from from universities and also NGOs in Brazil, uh, which has uh, um, uh, um, a time series for four different years. And when these data sets are combined in the model in Dynamica EGO, from here what we have uh, is the reading of that specific landscape and understanding of whether that that specific farms has had deforestation or not, and to what extent that deforestation has been done within the bounds of the legislation or not. And then there is a second problem here, which to, to basically try to understand if this specific farm has been producing soy and exporting soy, and then on the other hand, we need to understand if that specific farm is producing beef and exporting beef, with ha which has a further complexities I'm going to show you next. So this gives an idea uh, of the data sets that we use, such as uh, uh, the, the hydrography uh, provided by the, uh, uh, by, uh, the Brazilian Agency of Waters, ANA, uh, the land use from INPE and from Mapi Biomas and the, the car registries, which are all combined and then provide us uh, the ability to cut and to understand uh, first at municipal level and then at farm level. And here is, is an example of an analysis at farm level where the model identifies what, which are the areas which have deforested uh, within the boundaries and which are the areas that have the forest beyond the legal boundaries. Most, most importantly, uh, in the case of Brazil, most, in most states, every single farm has to conserve 
uh, at least 20% of native vegetation, while in the Amazon, they must conserve 80% of native vegetation in addition to keeping uh, repairing forests. So the model verifies those different features in addition to other ones also found uh, in the Brazil's forest code. Uh, and as you can, can imagine, this, is, uh, this involves a major uh, 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 computational uh, task and uh, and because of that we have been uh, working very hard on site basically adapting our own software with Dynamica uh, EGO to be able uh, to work in such vast amount of of, uh, of farms and uh, applying parallel computing we have been also developing uh, the software to better uh, to make to make the best use of specific hardware sets so uh, rather than using uh, um, on the cloud computing of approaches, uh, you know, uh, provided by Amazon or Google, uh, we have decided to do this using uh, 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 our own hardware. So we have developed, uh, we have adapted the software to run on high-end gaming computer, which actually makes good use of um, graphic uh, of graphic cards and, and and the GPUs in order to do this using GPUs and also parallel computing. Uh, and in this way, uh, while before. Uh, in the first versions of the model, uh, some of the analysis of a state which is the size of Mato Grosso, which is about the size of France and uh, and, uh, and Germany combined, uh, before it was taking something even a month to complete the analysis, now we are able to do the same analysis in a matter of uh, hours uh, within the same day. And these are some of the results uh, that we found in our research. Uh, first of all, it's the, it's the reading of the forest code compliance. So to see uh, uh, what's the situation of every single farm. So every one of those uh, uh, little squares here in red and green uh, is, in, is an in individual farm. And the ones in red are the ones that have uh, more forest debt. Uh, so basically they lack forests and, uh, and the ones in green they have forest surplus. And what we found is that uh, in total in the Amazon, a little more than a half of all farms have uh, uh, are, are uh, little about half of the farms are non-compliant uh, with the forest code, uh, mostly because they lack uh, the, the repairing uh, forests around rivers. Uh, and in the Cerrado, is actually about the same about the same percentage. And actually, this was was one of the surprising results we had because in the Cerrado. Uh, the conservation requirements are about uh, 20 to 35 percent of the property area, and in the Amazon, it's about 80 percent of the property area. And and rather than having, for instance, a much higher level of uh, compliance in the Cerrado in relation to the Amazon, had similar uh, uh, levels of compliance, which indicate that one of the key problems here is not so much the level of conservation requirement, but more the lack of enforcement that leads, even in the Cerrado, where requirements are lower, people to go in the forest what uh, they could not, so the forest illegally. So after having calculated here what's the situation of, of every single farm, we are able then to say, OK, the deforestation has taken place in that farm, as detected by EPIS monitor systems, most, most, most specifically uh, PRODES. Uh, okay, is that deforestation potentially legal or illegal? Okay, in order to be to, to deforest legally in Brazil, you need to have an authorization. However, uh, that authorization, which which is which is basically issued by the state governments, uh, is, is not a, is not public data. It's very difficult to get that data, and uh, and quite often, what has been the discourse of the sector and also the discourse of the Brazilian government has been that well, since you ca we cannot know uh, uh, if that farm had, has had an authorization or not, maybe everything is legal. But it's, it's not, right? Because the, the legislation in Brazil is very clear in terms of how much a forest uh, must be conserved at every single farm. So geosciences can be used here to simulate the work of, of, of a forest ranger uh, in, while analyzing the, the, the farms. And basically, uh, this is what we have done. And, uh, and we have identified that 15% uh, of the farms uh, in the Amazon and 20% of the farms in the Cerrado, they have deforested. And then by applying the rules of the forest code as modeled uh, by, the explicit, uh, by the special explicit uh, model implemented in, in Dynamica, uh, we have found that actually 82% of the deforestation taking place uh, in the, within the farms in the Amazon are actually illegal in, in the sense of potentially illegal because they do not respect the bounds specified by uh, the legislation. Then we are also able to make, uh, to look at the of the farms uh, because we have uh, uh, soy 
uh, crops being detected uh, on 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 its on its areas within its boundaries. And what we found here is that actually uh, there is an even higher level of lack of compliance in the farms which produce soy than on the, on the, on the other farms on average, both in the Cerrado and in the Amazon, with an even higher level of a lack of compliance uh, in the Cerrado, which was something that really surprised us. And, and it, this is very important, mostly because while in the Amazon you have uh, 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 an agreement called soy moratorium, uh, whereby farmers uh, uh, who clear a specific area cannot uh, grow soy crops in a specific area uh, after 2008, there is no, there are no agreements at all protecting the Cerrado, and, uh, and because of and, and with an expectation that um, farmers would protect. Uh, those native vegetation also because there are lower uh, conservation requirements, but that's not what we have found. Then we are also able to check, uh, applying the same rules as for other, other farms, uh, what's the situation uh, in terms of the deforestation observed after 2008. And as, as we have found, as we we'll see that actually uh, in the Amazon, we have a level of, of deforestation taking place inside those farms, which is soy farms, which actually is, is, is at the same levels as for the whole uh, uh, sample and, um, and, and with an even higher level of illegality. And in the, in the Cerrado, we have actually a much uh, um, 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 higher quantity of farms which have deforesting illegally in the Cerrado, within, where, whereby almost half of that deforestation in the Cerrado is illegal, even though the Cerrado has a more room for legal deforestation. From that, we are able then to identify uh, what are uh, the areas uh, which are the municipalities with illegal deforestation, and then to see how much of that illegal deforestation is actually contaminating soil production at farm level. So in here, we're, we're looking at not only uh, a deforestation that has ha happened inside the farm to, uh, and, and, being, and, uh, and basically being replaced by crops. So basically, it was there was forest in a given plot, and then there was there is soil next, but also uh, the deforestation that has been taken in a single farm for other purposes. Because what they have found, uh, especially in the Amazon, there's a lot of deforestation taking place at farm level, uh, where the farmer would simply put, uh, you know, that area for pasture or for, or for corn or for other crops. And, uh, and, uh, and at the end of the day, it would be something that would not prohibit that farm from selling soy, but would certainly be an issue because we are talking about soy being produced in a farm with illegal deforestation. And, and when you look at the, at the situation at the, at the two biomes, we see that there are some municipalities uh, in the Amazon and also here in the transi tra transition between Cerrado and the Amazon, where almost 100% of the soy being produced is linked to deforestation, where other areas, uh, such as here in, uh, you know, in part of the state of Minas Gerais and also Goiás, the state of Federal in Bahia, where actually less than 20% of the soy produced is linked to illegal deforestation. So the situation in Brazil is not heterogeneous. Uh, you have actually municipalities and, and specific farms which are doing a very bad job uh, in terms of keeping uh, and, and, and uh, their, in conserving forests. And you have, uh, um, and those, those are uh, what we call in the article the, the rotten apples, you know, those few that are creating problems to all of us. And, and then we also estimated how much of that soy uh, by looking at, uh, and this is also in combining our results with the results and the modeling uh, by uh, Trace, uh, which is uh, a platform which has been monitoring exports uh, uh, for a long time now, uh, and basically seeing how much of that soy being produced in the farms are being uh, then sold to different soy traders, and then where those, those to whom those soy traders are selling that it's produced and to which countries uh, within the EU uh, those products are being bought. Um, but now it comes to the next problem, which is uh, uh, beef production, uh, which is actually much, much harder to monitor than soy production because in contrast to soy, that where you can actually see the crops using remote sensing, you cannot see the cows as much using remote sensing. At least it's, it's, a, it's still uh, a challenging uh, uh, proposition because we would need some very high resolution uh, satellite imagery, and we don't not we do not have that right now uh, available for the for the entire country, nor methodologies available for doing that for the entire country. Um, and and but in order to do that, we have some other other documents that might be helpful. In particular, we have um, the Environmental Registry that I mentioned briefly, which 
have actually which whereby all farmers register with their names and also their ID numbers. And, and this same level of information is also available in a document called uh, G GTA, Guia de Transporte Animal, or, or, or Cattle Movement Authorization, uh, whereby a farmer, uh, by law, is required to declare to the government to whom it's he's selling uh, its cattle before uh, it's actually sent the cattle on its way. And, uh, and, and so it's possible to cross those two data sets uh, and then to be able to, to identify and to see what are the farms selling to whom and to form uh, the network with the different knots of that movement. Of course, there are some, some, some challenges here, especially because, for instance, you might have a, 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 a farm registered to a company and then you have the GTA uh, on the name of a specific person. So you need basically to, uh, to be able to access uh, public data databases with the names of the partners of a specific company in order to identify uh, who are these people. Also, there are problems related to, to, to farm names. Sometimes you have some slightly different farm names identified in, in, in one document and the other. So you need to have uh, uh, actually some to apply some smarter uh, uh, big data methods to join those different data sets. And also another big challenge is how do you form that network and understand uh, uh, where the, the meat is going? Because at the end of the day, it, uh, uh, all you know, all all, all cattle is going to be slaughtered uh, by different meat packers, small and big, and uh, mostly big ones. Because the big meat packers, especially in the Amazon and the Cerrado, they dominate the landscape. Uh, just four companies are responsible for more than sixty percent of all uh, uh, um, cattle slaughtered in the region. Um, and and those companies, they actually already most of them have system to monitor the direct suppliers, which means they would basically check if that specific farm had or did not have a specific, uh, uh, had or did not have deforestation. And if they did not have, for instance, like this red one, it would be blacklisted. Uh, otherwise it would sell the produce. However, what we see quite often are situations whereby uh, this guy is not deforesting. So in theory, it could be selling uh, uh, its meat to the meat packer. However, uh, this guy is buying a cattle from someone that has deforested. And, and so, we, so we have the situation of this big world of indirect suppliers, which right now are, it's, they are invisible uh, to uh, um, the meat packers themselves. And, uh, and so in order to identify them, uh, what we have done was combined the, 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 uh, the cattle movements and mapped the relation between the different farms and also established uh, a, a, a certain um, rules whereby if, for instance, like in this case, more than 20% of the cattle coming to the to specific node is coming from farms with deforestation, we consider that node then a deforestation node, even though that node might not have the forest itself, or, or even cases where we do not have spatial data about that specific node, because quite often, about in 30% of the, of the sample, we were not able to identify the specific farm that's selling or, or buying uh, cattle. And this enables us to, to, to visualize the supply chain like this, whereby we have, for instance, here in red, uh, the individual farms, which are direct suppliers to slaughterhouses, um, and the yellow ones, which are the, the indirect suppliers uh, to slaughterhouses, uh, but uh, are basically, sorry, which are also selling to slaughterhouses, but they are buying uh, from other smaller uh, farms quite often uh, uh, with deforestation. And this is the situation that we see. We have mapped a total of 11 million uh, cattle that have been slaughtered in the state of Pará between 2006 and 2019. And what we have found is that actually less than 1 million of those cattle slaughtered, we could not find any trace of uh, contamination by deforestation. Then you have the problem of direct uh, uh, contamination. So basically uh, direct deforestation where a cattle has been sold directly to a slaughterhouse uh, with uh, deforestation. However, the biggest problem is actually on, 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 on indirect level one, uh, which are basically the farms that sell to someone that then sells to uh, the farm, uh, the, the, the slaughterhouse in the end. And so basically when right now the monitoring systems adopted by the private companies that are looking only at the direct, they are only uh, literally only looking at the tip of the iceberg. Most of the problems are uh, in indirect suppliers. And so, um, we had um, a major policy impact uh, in our research uh, with more than uh, 80 news articles 
uh, in radio and TV all over the world, you know, The Guardian, BBC, uh, Deutsche Welle. I myself had to really uh, uh, spend a lot of time uh, talking to journalists, giving also interviews in four different languages. So it has been really, really challenging. And also um, with, with, with the article, we, that has led to uh, uh, in-depth engagement uh, with, the, uh, with the NGOs and also with the private sector. Uh, quite a few companies have been uh, tr uh, talking to us and coming to us to, to, to uh, try to, to establish some forms of collaboration. Also, we had um, uh, an agreement with the state of Pará jointly with INPE. And uh, actually, Alessandra, that's uh, uh, here uh, as one of the chairs, has also been involved in some of the conversations here. So she's also uh, uh, directly and indirectly part of, of the team here. And, um, and also, we have been involved in workshops with European Union officials and German officials, uh, trying to bring those ideas also into policy that's being discussed right now at the EU level. And, and also, we have helped uh, a congressman uh, called uh, Zé Silva, which actually happens to be from the Agricultural Caucus, uh, to come up with a, a, a bill, a law proposal, uh, to basically improve the transparency and the monitoring of supply chains. Uh, of course, that has not been easy and has not and has been very challenging. And I would uh, put the main challenges here in terms of first having to work in a very multidisciplinary uh, environment uh, where we had to talk all the time with people from you know from law, from computer science, uh, uh, from different branches of engineering, from remote sensing. Also, very dynamic because as we moved with the research, uh, the situation has changed. Uh, we had a new government, we had a hike in the first station, we had a new, the new debates going on at the, at the level of the European Union. So uh, basically, if, uh, uh, as we were writing the article and as, as the article was under review, for instance, in science, uh, we had some, some, uh, some changes going on also at the EU level that had to, to be incorporated. Uh, and also it's, it has been very demanding, uh, not only research-wise, uh, in terms of putting together all these data set and working with this team, but also in terms of communication, uh, because since it's something with which with a lot of interest and and a lot of of demand from other other sectors, private sector, government, and so on and so forth, also we had also really to divide our time between doing the actual research and communicating, dealing with other publics and other users. Um, for that purpose, actually, uh, we are dealing here. Uh, with with big science, you know, we we, are, we have to put together and thanks to mostly thanks to the work uh, of uh, Professor Betaldo in the last twenty years uh, to put together a, a big team uh, doing big science with a large, well integrated team, and also with uh, making a huge effort to have stable funding sources uh, in order to keep up uh, that that infrastructure, and especially right now where Brazil's. Uh, uh, public research money is, is increasing uh, lower. Uh, we had to really compete uh, uh, internationally to get that, those resources uh, and also to, to, to work very closely with uh, uh, different sectors uh, in order to be able to combine uh, uh, work which is applied also with some basic science work. And finally, um, uh, actually uh, more important and more challenging the technical scientific ones, which have been really challenging, uh, were the social, legal, and managerial obstacles. Uh, so which really shows that the need of having your team, uh, also social scientists, uh, people which are engaged with, with, with policy, people that understand how uh, decision-making is made at political level and, 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 and how to connect uh, with those processes, um, which, uh, which of course, it's an additional uh, challenge here. That's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any queries, just get in touch. Thank you very much. Professor Veraldo. I think you don't have the, the audio here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor Ajão, for delivering us the, this wonderful talk. It is a nice opportunity for us all to know a bit more about the Amazon and also the Cerrado, that is our Brazilian savanna. Uh, we will start now the discussion sections. 
for the participants. They can uh, write actually the questions. These discussion sections I will hand to Dr. Alessandra Rodriguez Gomez from Sensipan and INPE. Thank you for being here. And also to a very recent doctor, Gabriela Takahashi Mayoshi. Thank you also for being here. And I don't want to make it longer than 30 minutes. So if the audience has some questions, please uh, write in the chat. Okay, and uh, in case that we have several unanswered questions, okay, I will ask Professor Ajon actually to answer them and put in our web page. Okay, so now we can start the discussion section then. There is a one questions here from Flavia. If Alexandra wants to read it. Okay, Vinaldo, uh, thanks for your presentation, uh, Raoni. Uh, well, the first question is from Flavia. How to solve, oh, oh, you changed the first one. How to encourage, oh, <laughs> let me know if one or three. <laughs> okay, three, stop there. Uh, how to solve the problem of Cerrado and Amazon Ecotony transition area, where we have a great challenge in distinguishing between the Cerrado and Amazon biomes. What do you think, Raoni? Well, th this is a big uh, problem, and, um, and I think there is no easy solution beyond officially defining what is what is Cerrado and where where is the Amazon? Just to give you an example, how it works in practice right now in the state of Mato Grosso, in particular, uh, where uh, farmers that find themselves in the Amazon uh, uh, in the Amazon biome, according to IBGE map, they would look for the Hado map to see whether they are in the Cerrado there. If they are the Cerrado, they would say they would ask the government to look at the other map, which allowed them to clear more. And even if they are in the both in the Cerrado. Uh, in, in the in the IBGE map, in the Hadam map, uh, uh, as part of the of the Amazon, they would still uh, pay for a uh, uh, forest engineer to come by and evaluate the area, and with a very high chance of fraud, because it's basically one guy being paid to tell whether a farmer can use twenty percent of their farm or sixty five percent of their farm, which is more than three times more, which means having a land that's three times, uh, that's worth three times more money than if you are in the other side. Uh, and so in the same way you have, you know, a, a, quite often a very arbitrary division between a country. Where, so there is like a, a borderline that passes here. Uh, we also need in this case, a clear map that shows this is the borderline. Uh, otherwise we are going to always have uh, that kind of debate, especially because due to climate change, we have, we have in a savanization, we have, you know, the, the, uh, uh, a change in the aspects, uh, in the phytophysiognomy of, of the area. And also if you have an area of, of forests and you put fire in that area for many, many years, especially in this, those areas where there is some transition, what it used to look like, so we used to have a phytophysiognomy as forest, after a few years, you look like Cerrado, not because it was born that way, because you made that way. And then you have a prize. You can then clear that area. Uh, uh, rather than, than conserve it. Uh, so I think it's, it's an issue that's, that, that should be decided more from a bureaucratic point of view, a legislative point of view, than a scientific point of view. Okay, thank you. I think that you can, can uh, answer Flavia, uh, and I will, uh, can I can I start with the, uh, continue with the second question, Veraldo? Gerardo, you are without uh, mic. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, Gabriela and uh, you can both okay, uh, so I... share actually reading. I will try to highlight the questions here. Okay, Gabriela, you can you can sit, uh, read oh. the, the next one, okay? Okay, thank you, Alessandra. Thank you, Raoni, also. Um, Flavia is asking how to encourage the local community to be more interested in working with companies that preserve forests than with those that deforest. Well, I think um, 
when you talk about local communities, it's it's a very wide range of actors, and uh, and you have on the one hand farmers, which actually are really serious about doing a good job, and others that are not, and then you have indigenous populations which suffer uh, from the expansion of agri agricultural production. Um, so I think it's it's very difficult to if you uh, to adopt a very uh, bottom up perspective where it starts from the ground. Uh, what quite often is much more effective is when us consumers, buyers, uh, you know, uh, uh, countries that buy from Brazil uh, basically require Brazilian companies to be more serious about Brazil's own legislation. And then companies should be more seriously about where they're buying from, and then they're going to go to their to to the to the to the, to the local community, to the farms that provide uh, uh, the beef and the soy to them, and basically say, "Well, I'm not interested in buying uh, soy and beef from deforestation. You need to get your act straight." And this is, is it has been this can be very transformational because right now one of the sad stories about this is that if you are uh, a farmer that does everything all right and, and do not deforest and try to produce the most sustainable way, uh, uh, which actually we, I'm from a family which from you know a, a farmer's family. You know we, we still have some produce some cheese here in Minas Gerais. It's quite cliche because Minas Gerais is very famous for for the cheese. Um, and uh, and in comparison to other farmers that go there and deforest everything, uh, we are losing money, right? Uh, we are the ones at at, at basically uh, losing. And unless there is a strong enforcement of the legislation, and unless they have companies which actually are really invested in uh, make that differentiation, then the, the farmers that are doing good are the ones to lose first. Yes, I think the farmers wants to sell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, well. The next question is from Mohamed Helmi. I think that is very interesting because it's related to my 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 work, my job here. <laughs> uh, well, uh, how many? How was the role of Brazilian satellite to facilitate the missing data, which was critical for spatial modeling for this problem regarding tracking illegal activities? Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. Uh, well, actually, Alessandra would be even better to to answer to that question, uh, and actually, I would give her this the floor to to compliment if she wants to. Uh, I mean, one of the huge differences uh, which made all the made our work possible has been the work done uh, mostly uh, uh, by INPE uh, in the last years. Because when you have a, a good uh, satellite monitoring system going on, such as Prodes, that becomes the infrastructure the basis for other work and and then you still start scaffolding and deal with with other issues and try for instance to understand why is it so you know what is the linkage between deforestation and supply chains that we have done uh, in this specific research and um and so it's it's very important to 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 keep that in, in keep in keep supporting that and and also it's very important i believe to have that as a as a separate institutions from uh, from, uh, from the ministries themselves and from the users themselves, some of the final users themselves, uh, because it, it, that distance allows some, some uh, allows for stronger rigor and neutrality uh, in this process. Um, so that's why I think it, you know it's it's very important uh, uh, to to uh, basically um, uh, to recognize the work that has been done uh, by the Brazilian Space Institute in, the, in, in the, all those years in providing that data infrastructure. Uh, yeah, thank you, Hawani. I think that we don't have, we don't, we are not in the, in the, this phase, we don't have data. We have a lot of data. We have to choose what kind of data we can use and what kind of monitoring we can handle to, to, to handle with this kind, kind of questions. Uh, so I think that the, the choose is, is not only technical, but uh, in our country is more political to decide what kind of data we can use and how we can help or try to avoid the deforestation or this kind of uh, illegal practices. So uh, we are waiting for the new signs of the new, the new time with the, this, this amount of data. Okay, Gabriela? Yes, uh, Iara Nascimento, she wants to know if this methodology can be replicated for other production chains? Um, yeah, thanks for, for the question, Yara. Yes, it, it's possible to, to do that. And, and indeed, one of the 
the possibilities it's uh, that we have been considering is for a timber monitoring because also we have a similar document which is which is issued as timber moves through uh, uh, the supply chain and um, but then it, and it potentially it's possible to apply that for instance, even for the countries for instance uh, in uh, in Argentina they have a, a, a farm registry system as well the a cadaster and you have the, the maps with uh, uh, for instance Hansen is working on a, on a soy map. So it in, in the, so it, it, theoretically it would be possible to do uh, a similar a similar job there and apply the methodology there. Uh, data data limitations, especially to know where the farms are uh, and where the soil is, these are basically tends to be the, the most limiting uh, problem. And then then the cattle it's another uh, 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 big issue as well. Yes, thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay thank you, thank you, Mateo. thank you, Hawani. How many, uh, there is a question here. Is there any study for a global certification of meat of soy and soy products similar to what is done with uh, wood and FSCs, uh, uh, Forest Steward Council or some certification uh -huh. or something? Do you think that? Um, it's, it, that's actually a very good question. And there has been some debates, especially at the EU level about the, about that however uh i don't think that's going to work because timber certification is not working you know if you look for instance uh, independent evaluations of forest certification uh, um, being exported to, to europe uh what we found is that at when uh, the state finally go there and check whether there has been uh all the of the timber bought by a specific company in europe has has had all the certifications they have they have they usually find a very high level of irregular irregularities and the um, the punishment is very low. For instance, in this study, uh, I forgot the, the institution that has done it. They have found that after fine for importing illegal timber is, uh, in the UK, is something like three thousand pounds. You know, this this is the price of a chair, right? Of a very fancy table from from hardwood. And so, if you sell if you sell one chair, then you can pay the fine, and then it's fine. You still buy from you know from brazil africa and from other countries even if it's illegal so i think the solution here is not so much investing more money on private certification tend to be very expensive but investing more money on on independent transparent monitoring such as the one provided by impe such as the, the the registry that we have for our farmers in brazil such as the study that we have done that have combined those different elements and then freely and openly provide that data uh, from the different uh, groups and then based on that we i, I think uh, we have to be able we're going to be able to have a more accountable uh, supply chain and, uh, and a supply chain with less deforestation uh, and do you also intend to use this new uh, methodology with the applied methodology in the climate change uh, yeah, there's been this this new uh, set of imagery provided by uh, a contract by the Norwegian government, uh, whereby they're going to pr provide monthly uh, uh, mosaics at three meters resolution, uh, provided by Planet, but also by Airbus, uh, which actually can uh, can enable some some new applications, but not for deforestation, in my view, uh, because deforestation is something which does not, you know, it doesn't matter, even from a supply chain point of view if a tree right a three meters by three meters area that used to be green is not green anymore a tree has fallen uh, it's, the problem is not about a tree the problem is about huge areas and uh, and we're talking about here some deforestations uh, that cover areas of hundreds and hundreds of hectares and um, and right now with the resolution that we already have in the monitoring systems provided by by impe which is at, at 30 meters uh, it's plenty uh, to detect uh, uh, supply chains and and, and also um, we have to be very careful because you might have an ultra precise monitoring of uh, la uh, land cover, but then if you don't have uh, um, a property database which is as precise, it doesn't matter. And quite often you have many problems in the car registry. Uh, that's why, for instance, in our study we have adopted as 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 in order to uh, uh, observe the uh, as a sensibility test. Uh, and we have considered only deforestation, illegal deforestation, when it's beyond six hectares, which is the minimum mapping area from Prodes, uh, and also when it's at least 12 uh, hectares. Uh, and we and, and so and you don't need, you know, three meter satellite imagery to find uh, six hectares. 
uh, which you know it's sixty thousand square meters, something like this. Uh, uh, if you know, top of my head. So it's you're talking about uh, big areas here. However, if uh, one thing might be, for instance, uh, actually it's a challenge here for the remote sensing guys hearing us. Maybe we are able to identify and do the cat the, the count of the of, of how many cattle heads you have in a single farm. Who knows, right? Or maybe we can also another big agenda is. Uh, um, forest restoration, regeneration, especially the, as the initial uh, 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 moments for the first years, uh, where the 30 meters was not going to see uh, uh, the seedlings and the initial process of forest regeneration. Uh, so I think there are many other applications that it's possible to do uh, with those three meters, uh, but not necessarily deforestation. Okay, thank you, Hawani. And what kind of, uh, what about the computational resources needed for this kind of research? Maria Bunty is asking for. Asking to. Yeah, uh, as as I mentioned briefly during during my talk, this has been one of the one of the key challenges here, and we have tested different approaches. Uh, we have tested, you know, running our own uh, uh, big server uh, that has cost you know quite a few uh, uh, thousand dollars. Uh, we have tried also to send things to, to cloud computing and to see how, how it behaves. But in the end of the day, uh, the best solution we have found was to um, buy high-end computers uh, for especially gaming computers, especially because of the GPU, which costs around uh, 10 to, 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 to $20,000. So these are not cheap, but you know it's feasible for a research group to have that. And, uh, and then uh, to adapt our software and adapt the modeling to best use those resources. And actually, right now, we are getting faster results and better results than Google and Amazon Web Services in our little homemade service, server. Why? Because we are making this very good fit between software, hardware, and modeling, which often is not the case when you have those, 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 those big systems where you, it tends to use more brute force. Uh, and so I think it's, you know, of course, it's, it's it's, it has, we have to deal with that because we're dealing with so many uh, uh, farms and it's, our study has covered almost 1 million individual properties, analyzing one by one deforestation, cattle, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we, unless we had put in place those kind of, of uh, in, uh, innovations also in the computer science arena, uh, that would not be possible. Yes, thank you. Um, Emily, she wants to know how do we urge government agencies to utilize studies like this in monitoring environmental activities and regulating business when these private sectors insist on safeguarding their operations? Yeah, Emily, it's um, uh, thanks for the question. It's a very appropriate question uh, because that's the situation we have right now. You know, companies are the ones uh, saying that they want to do more because they've been pressed by their clients. They are the ones actually uh, putting together those monitoring systems. But this is a, a governmental uh, uh, responsibility. Can you imagine, for instance, monitoring the med cow disease by self-regulatory companies doing their own monitoring? Why should we let companies monitor individually, not by the government deforestation? Because there is a conflict of interest. You know, it, the companies will want to show they are the best. You know, they want to show they don't have deforestation. Why well, quite often they might have deforestation, right? And that's why we have been insisting with governmental actors uh, to adopt that type of technology with mixed results. Uh, we do not have had so much a good answer from the federal government, but we had had, had a good answer from the state government of Pará which actually ha happens to be the state in Brazil with the highest level of deforestation. So we hope by, 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 to lead by example, right? To show that it's possible and, and to, to show that it's possible to do that in a given state. And then other states might follow suit and maybe the federal government might follow suit. And maybe the Brazilian Congress might approve uh, the, this new bill uh, that we have helped uh, uh, Congressman Zé Silva to develop and then to, have, to make that a countrywide monitoring system. Okay, thank you, Hawani. And sorry for changing up the the order of questions. Sorry, everyone. But the, the next question is from Maria Bunty again. Uh -huh. uh, she would like to know to ask what is the scalability that you talk about in your presentation, Hawani? Well, um, it's basically, when you, when you have the infrastructure together, and when you have the, the very good fit between. Uh, the individual, the, the software, the hardware, and the modeling, 
uh, it's possible to have uh, to go from the analysis of a, of a single municipality uh, up to the, that you can do in your laptop, uh, up to the analysis of an entire biome or even the entire country uh, that you can do in those uh, uh, specially built uh, uh, little servers that they have been talking about. Uh, so it's it's possible to 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 scale uh, that up. Uh, but of course, you know, it's uh, maybe the difference here is that um, we are not using an off-the-shelf solution. Right. So if, for instance, someone is to develop that kind of solution to another country, to another context, uh, they will need to see what are, the, what are the rules to be applied, what are the data sets to be applied, and then also adapt, uh, if possible, the software to, to, uh, uh, to the specific needs. So thank you. And Benjamin, uh, he wants to know if there is any international law to force the government to prevent deforestation. Well, uh, there isn't uh, international law such as that because um, you know every country in the world is sovereign, so it has the freedom and and the, and the, to establish it, its own regulations. So Brazil can can basically has the liberty and has the sovereignty to say, well, in my country, I allow a certain level of deforestation to take place under the law, uh, but however. Uh, if you look at uh, international trade regulations, and in, in, for instance, also the, the, the rules that has been put inside the, the under negotiation now agreement between Brazil and I mean Mercosur and, and the European Union, what is establishing there is that a country can decide what level of environmental conservation and protection it has. However, a country must do it, its best to implement its legislation, and it cannot have an undue advantage by not implementing its own legislation, because basically that's uh, uh, with, you know, let's say the Europe, uh, European companies really work hard to, to, to follow its own laws and Brazilian companies don't work hard to, to, to implement its own laws because the Brazilian government close an eye, that could be an infringement of international uh, 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 regulations on trade. So there is this possibility. And that's why, for instance, in our research, it was very important not only to look at deforestation, generally speaking, but legal versus illegal deforestation, because it's about the ability of Brazil and the ability of the, of the companies to uh, to produce uh, following the legislation or not. Yes. And I think it's also related with, we can also relate this with the Amazon fund, because Norway and Germany, they suspend this Amazon fund because of the amount of deforestation. The legal Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's 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 possible to, to say that, but it's um, but there, there is a bit of a difference there because um, uh, the Amazon fund, the new money going to the Amazon fund, uh, it's calculated uh, the quota that countries uh, can donate towards uh, the Amazon fund is calculated based on how much deforestation uh, has been reduced in relation to the historic average. Uh, and, and actually, there has been a, an ongoing reduction because the prestation of the that quote because the prestation has been going up. But then there is a second problem of the money that's already in the fund, and that has been for new projects also frozen, basically because uh, when the money has been donated to Brazil, there has been an agreement, uh, actually a donation agreement, a formal contract saying that that money is going to be managed by a governance system with the state, with the states, the federal government, and the NGOs and the private sector. Because the Amazon fund is a fund for Brazil, it's not the fund for the federal government. There's a difference there. And, and, and the current government did not, did not agree with that rule. They wanted the fund to be its own money. And, and then the donor said, well, that's not what we agreed to. So there has been this ongoing debate right now, and hopefully they're going to find a solution to that. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is a participant that is very is surprised that the permit, I think that the permission for land use change are not available publicity, publicity in Brazil. Uh, is that a recent regulation or, or has always been the norm in Brazil? How many? Yeah, I, well, actually we have had an, uh, an attempt to increase transparency. It's funny because since 2018, the Ministry of Environment uh, has been trying to, to, to pass a series of, of norms, uh, uh, basically demanding the states, which are the ones providing the, 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 
the land use author, uh, and land use change, the deforestation authorizations, to send that data to to the federal government so that we would have a centralized data set. But that doesn't work. If you go there and look at the data sets, it basically has almost no records. And and then when you actually finally when you are finally able to talk to the states and build the relationship and get the data, you see that the number of authorizations by the states actually is actually much higher than the ones inside uh, the system. And I think uh, the reason for that is, is even though it's by law that that was supposed to be trans transparent, there is not a strong political interest in making that transparent. Because if if the if since it's in the law, uh, if you know the ministry really wanted to, he would even he would even send. Uh, the public attorneys, right, to force to give this, this, the single states to provide the data as they wanted to. And I'm, I'm sure for pay, to in order to pay taxes, they are very diligent in data sharing, data provision. Uh, but in order to uh, uh, to share data related to deforestation, they close an eye, it's not such a high uh, uh, um, um, uh, priority. So we have, also we have not only a legal, but also a political issue here. Yes, thank you. And Mohammed he has a, a comment. He he said to us, "I guess that the main challenge is to spread benefits and awareness within law makers and politics to rely on geoscientists, methodologists to monitor and catch illegal activities within the country." Yeah, I think this is this is uh, one of the key challenges here, uh, but it's not the only one uh, because. Uh, for instance, for a long time, we have been showing that it's possible uh, to improve monitoring and to improve law enforcement remotely. Right now, more than a half of the deforestation taking place in Brazil are in farms that the government know who they are because they have given their, their ID numbers. Okay, there, there are some fake ID numbers, there are many problems, but at least there's some data there. And still, the most uh, 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 the mostly applied form of law enforcement uh, is going to the to the ground, visiting farms, etc. Uh, very, very, you know, a very small percentage of of, of, of fines, less than actually uh, ten percent of the fines today are being issued remotely. Even though more than fifty percent of the deforestation are, the, are are taking place in farms where you have that kind of information. So I think there is uh, some methodological issues. Uh, some issues of, of data sharing and, and, and methodological sharing, but also I think there is uh, uh, sometimes a, a cultural issue because you know law enforcement agencies are also used to work in a very old-fashioned way and go into the field, etc. And then there is also you know sometimes uh, uh, it's you know to, to enforce the legislation is very is very costly politically. You know it doesn't get you votes when you start finding people and 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 basically forcing them to. Uh, and in, in Brazil is a democracy. We need that the politicians need those votes. So there is, you know, uh, uh, quite often a conflict of interest when it comes to that. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, I think that is another question here, how only for you. Uh, Emerson Leon would like to know if in your model is considered the fire activity by clearing. I think that is clear, clear cut. And what is the main challenge to modeling biodiversity? Two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in this study that I just presented, we do not talk about fires. Uh, we are only looking at clear cut deforestation, also because uh, this is the less uh, controversial one in terms of detection, uh, with that the one that's less prone to false positives. And it's basically, when you have clear cut, it's because the farmer has decided to change the land use. So it's usually much more irreversible than, than a fire that might be, you know, coming from your neighbor and, 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 and then you can always justify it. Um, also, what we have here uh, is a situation where uh, you might have uh, um, uh, um, which come into the issue of, of, uh, of fires. Uh, what we have done, however, also to understand this relation between fires and deforestation was a, was a study uh, with, with two colleagues from IMPE, uh, uh, Ana Paula Guia uh, uh, in, in Claudio, uh, where we have basically uh, look at, at uh, whether a fire that has been taking place in a given area, uh, whether that area is forest, whether the area is a consolidated agricultural area, or whether that area has been recently cleared. 
uh, so that we know whether what's the relationship between fire and deforestation. And what we have found is that um, during the, the the high season period, when it's when it's dry, just right now, more than a half of the deforestation taking place uh, in Brazil in, in, in the Amazon are actually happening in areas of recent deforestation. So it's deforestation related fires. Uh, this is not, you know, some indigenous guy putting fire to make a little uh, hossa or, or a little uh, uh, um, um, substance um, farming, but it's actually uh, big farmers wanting to clear the land to put more cattle on. Um, and then when it comes to, to um, uh, biodiversity modeling, it's, it's, it is challenging. And actually we have another work uh, led here in our group by uh, Uberajar Oliveira. Uh, we, have, we have been applying uh, 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 modeling of biodiversity with some some success, and I would you know if you Google for us in Ubirajara and Ajo etc., you're going to find some some articles related to that. Yeah, thank you. And Diogo, he has a question. What about the tracking of the illegal wood from this deforestation? Do you have information about that? Um, yeah, it's it's you know we haven't. Uh, done that yet and as far as, as i as i know um and nobody has actually uh tried to apply the same methods you have used for other areas uh to automatically track all the possible and then uh, there has been some efforts to do this manually like okay this is this area what's going on and then basically this is a police work uh, uh but i think there is a, a huge uh, uh potential there uh, especially when you relate for instance movements with um forest uh projects which tends also to have some problems there, and in remote sensing. So that you can see, for instance, if a guy declares that he's transporting that much uh, uh, that, that much volume of timber from one area to the other, is, is that timber being extracted from that area? Because then you can, you know, uh, uh, by looking at the selective logging, uh, is it really going to this other area? Then you can check that as well. And so I think there's some big potential there, even though it's, I think it's one of the uh, um, frontiers of knowledge. There has been some done some work on this, but I think there's a lot more to be done. Thank you. And uh, there is a question from Fazal Malik. Malik. Uh, do you know which countries in the world is doing more efficient work regarding deforestation-free activities? Do you know how many? It's, um, it's difficult to tell. I mean, uh, I would say Brazil five years ago. Because actually that has been a question in another webinar. People were basically asking, okay, which country should Brazil inspire to do a better job? And my answer was Brazil. You know, Brazil is actually was is the uh, um, it's the only big tropical country in the world that has been able to drastically reduce reforestation with policies, with technology, with monitoring systems, and uh, and it's able to do this again and it's able to 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 improve it again. Another thing which actually is a bit of a difference of Brazil in relation to other countries, um, uh, Brazil is it's actually the biggest and richest uh, country in the world with high levels of deforestation. If you look at the other countries with high levels of tropical deforestation, you are comparing Brazil with Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Congo. I mean, uh, uh, of course, I mean, they, they probably have some lessons there, uh, but tropical deforestation is not, or, or, or large scale deforestation is not a problem in Europe or United States, quite the contrary. There they are reforesting more than they are deforesting. Um, so I think, you know, we have to find our own path and we have been able to find that before, and I'm sure we're going to find that next. Uh, just a, the, just a comment. Uh, well, I think that probably South America or Amazon Basin we have different countries there uh, here near, next to to us that probably learn a lot of uh, Brazilian technique techniques. So I think that probably they have. I don't I don't I don't have the name one name. It is not. It's complicated just to 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 tell. Uh, it's a name. Is Bolivia? Is is. Ecuador or other country, but I think that they have technology and the knowledge to develop um, similar similar uh, projects uh, as Brazil is doing. Suriname has is, uh, they have a very interesting systems there, but well, I think that we there is not a uh, how can I say numbers to prove uh, if there is a success case or not, and if they are doing the best job. I, I agree with you. Thank you, Noel. 
Well, we are going actually to close our discussion section. I just want to hand either to Gabriela and Alessandra if you have personally, let's say, some questions to Professor Roni, please feel free. Thank you. Can I? Can I ask your opinion about uh, what do you think it will happen with these uh, these deforestation, these supplies provided because of deforestation, with these uh, increasing of forest fires in fires in Brazil, and if they de deconstructed the law about these APP areas, these areas of uh, uh, area of permanent reserve, what do you think it will increase here or? Yeah, I think uh, in relation to the second one, um, well, our emphasis here has been on, on legality. And of course, when you when you basically lower the bar, what is legal and what is illegal, uh, it it's again becomes becomes a problem. Uh, and so that's, I think that society has, especially civil society in Brazil, uh, citizens have uh, to play a very important role here in basically uh, telling the government, telling Congress that they don't agree, you know, they want for instance, their 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 mangas, they want their dunes, they want their their their, their, their forests uh, uh, protected. Uh, as for the fires, I think uh, it's, it remains to be seen because, um, and I think that the, the the key question is going to become after because fires are uh, one tends to be one of the stages of clearing, and uh, and I think what we're going to see probably next year is a, is a, a level of deforestation also linked uh, to that. Uh, especially, for instance, in areas such as Pantanal, uh, if following the fires, uh, farmers would go there, for instance, and introduce exotic uh, uh, pasture species, and that would basically uh, uh, would allow for uh, a definitive and permanent land use change. Uh, but it's still to be to be to be seen. Alessandra. Okay. Okay, I have the last one <laughs> question. Uh, let's check here because I, I wrote. Okay, um, of course that your presentation was is extremely useful in current and urgent uh, issues that is uh, uh, happening in our country. But thinking in terms of uh, young students and professionals present here, my question comes from this line. How do you believe that the students and young professionals in, in remote sensing in geo, geo techniques can help or support this kind, your the, the kind of your research? Um, how do you and your partners perform the technical technical procedures to obtain data and generate information for analysis and uh, projects, scholarships, contracts? It's a uh, uh, how can I say it's a, an idea to help the young professional here understand that. Uh, of course, in, uh, even if we have COVID this time, uh, lockdown and quarantine, but we ha still have work, a lot of work and ways to, to move on forward uh, on the geo, geo techniques, techniques issues. Please help us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think that there is you know, a lot, lots of room for, for multiplication. Um, for instance, in, if you type in, uh, you know, the uh, csr.webmg.br, which is the lab uh, of remote sensing, uh, and, and then you click on the article on, on, on um, uh, rotten apples, uh, you're going to see that we have there uh, uh, almost all of the input that data that we use, a very good description of that, and also the models. So, for instance, let's say you are from Argentina, right, and you want to uh, apply uh, uh, the, the rules uh, of the local legislation that you happen to to understand how it works. You can adapt our models to do that, and then run in, on your computer and do that as your as as, as part of your master's, PhD, or uh, or, or professional professional research uh, uh, effort. Um, so I think it's it's you know the, and and also. Uh, uh, as, as that is applied to other contexts, even within Brazil, you know, we would be very happy for people to do that. And maybe come back to us and say, look, we have found that in the state of Sergipe, for instance, there is a specific legislation such and such, and we have applied this, this here. We have added this other level of, of, of complexity to, to the model, and we have used some new data, data sources. We have come up with a way to 
uh, do the counts of cattle using high resolution imagery, you know, and uh, you know, there's so many things to be done here. And, uh, and, uh, and I would be very happy to see how that evolves. Okay, thank you, Ramani. Well, Alessandra actually took my question. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the entire supply chain is something very complex and has several components. Right? And my question was to considering that most of the audience here is young professionals right? have finished recently, let's say, master, PhDs or are doing Right? master, PhDs, or bachelors. So what would be, in your point of view, some open research questions or challenge that could be for them something to, to, to focus in their studies if they want to do something related in that subject? Right? And also job opportunities in your point of view that could be also established actually mm -hmm. um so answering from from, from under the perspective i think um well we started with brazil and with the amazon with Cerrado and with beef and soy because you know these are the the most threatened biomes in the world uh these are the products most exported uh, in the world and uh, by brazil brazil is a big country uh, and then we found, for instance, that 20% of the soy exported uh, from Brazil to the EU are linked to uh, deforestation. But for instance, Argentina is a huge uh, soy exporter and Chaco is also a threatened biome. So how much deforestation is taken on in the supply chains from, from Argentina and from Paraguay and the beef from Uruguay? Right, and in the United States, right, because they have their own problems in terms, for instance, of uh, nitrates pollution in the water uh, linked to beef production. Uh, so, how much of that beef is produced with a, huge, a high uh, uh, economic impact and then maybe exported to, to the EU or exported to China? So, I think that uh, what, I, what I would like to see is not is, uh, is this research as not the final step, also because it's you know it's it, it sheds light into Brazil, but. But uh, the precision free supply chains are global problems, not solely uh, a Brazilian problem. So I think, you know, uh, for the different professionals in different areas, uh, that would be a big challenge. And, and I think it is an area uh, where uh, there are job opportunities, both uh, in the industry, both in government, uh, both in, in research groups. Uh, uh, you know, in our own research groups, uh, we are always looking for, for, for talents. Uh, because it's, it's it's it is really 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 challenging, and um, and uh, you need you know increasingly specialized people in areas such as spatial uh, um, uh, relational uh, uh, databases. Uh, you need people specialized in modeling. You need programmers. You need uh, policy uh, uh, analysts. You need lawyers, and and of course uh, for geoscientists, uh, it's very exciting to work in in, in such an environment. Wonderful, perfect. Well, uh, we are coming now to almost one and a half hour. I think it's wonderful time here. And I just want to, oh, most of the participants are still online. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, we still have uh, in our web page uh, the information for our next uh, talks. Uh, please check this uh, web page. And uh, time by time, the Brazilian chapter of GRS is also offering different activities. So please stay tuned in this web page so that you can take part. And for us, it's actually a great uh, pleasure. This bring uh, us also a challenge of making hybrids events in future, not only <laughs> in presence, but also broadcasting it. So this is really a, a challenge, but I think this is really interesting as well. Eh? So we can enhance the, the discussions and enlarge the discussion. 
Well, I am sorry if we miss any questions, but I don't think so. If so, we will put in our web page. Professor Rajan, thank you again, actually, for your time. <laughs> and yeah, delivering us actually this special and interesting talk. A nice opportunity actually to, to come and to know a little bo bit more about Amazon and the challenge involved in that. Nah? So, yeah, there is no firewall or any mm -hmm. other <laughs> ceremony. Nah, I think we will close actually. Also, thank okay. tremendously Gabriela and Alessandra and all the team here uh, involved. Without this support, it was never been been possible. No? And thanks again for Raoni mm -hmm. for being the, the first talk of a series of these events. And, and if, if I may, Professor, it's, it has been a really pleasure. You know, thanks for all the audience, the questions. I've been following here some of the comments uh, on on, uh, on YouTube. And for me, it's a bit of a homecoming because you know I'm a computer scientist by training, and uh, and then has been a long way, you know, from into uh, the you know the social science and management, and then modeling, and then you know uh, environmental issues. To now, it's 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 very nice to be back talking. To, to a community with, of course, with its terms, it's interdisciplinary, but with uh, lots of people also from, from computer science here as well and in electrical engineering. So it's a really pleasure to be here. Perfect. Wonderful. So we now then uh, finish our first uh, lecture. Uh, thank you all for attending and also taking part. And Please join us in the forthcoming talks. No? It will be one or two talks per week in average till December 10. No? And the topics are very broad. So I think that some of more topics and will be of great interest for the general community. So thank you all and see you next time then.